the whole reason we were talking about this chart is to talk about what happens to protein when we eat it. Does it turn into biologically useful material? How much of it turns into glucose? What environment context does the body turn it into glucose? Does it even get used as, you know, fuel? And uh, we were messaging about that. So, you know, looking at Dr. Ben Bigman's work, contrasting it with some of protein scientists like Dr. Don Lehman, Dr. Stu Phillips, what are, you know, some of the conclusions that you've come to? Okay, so I've come to a little bit different conclusions from all of them. I agree by and large with Dr. Lehman. Um, I think that he gave the most uh, comprehensive response. Um, and I think that Ben Bickman is uh, an insulin expert, so we have to listen to what he has to say as well, because obviously protein and insulin interact. So we need to understand that aspect. Uh, I think that's a lot more important than, than the interaction with fat and, and carbs and so forth. But so it seems, uh, if I remember correctly, Dr. Lehman said that indeed, 60% uh, of protein will turn to glucose. Uh, I think your question was, is if you eat 100 gram protein, will 60 gram of that turn to glucose? And so he said, yes. And so I did a little analysis. So he mentioned that you have 20 amino acids of which two are ketogenic and the rest of them are glucogenic. That's yeah. not quite correct. Because of the rest that are glucogenic, mm -hmm. there are five that can be either ketogenic or glucogenic depending upon who you are. And so on that little chart that I sent to you, I use a color coding and I explained what was what. So if you're in ketosis, then those five that could switch sides will switch. And potentially, we don't know, it depends on many situations, and may burn as, glucose, as ketones or they may burn as glucose. So then what I did, I looked at, um, the, the, for example, in the ribeye, we know precisely which ones had a glucogenic and a ketogenic, and I summed them up. We know exactly how many grams, uh, grams we have of each. And so um, of the variable glucogenic or ketogenic, we have 5.23 grams. Of the purely ketogenic, we have 5.26 grams. And um, in the glucogenic only, we have 19.1 grams. Okay? So when I'm looking at the sum, I'm calculating the percent, if the ones that are variable turn to ketones and not glucose, then 64% will turn to glucose in the ribeye. If we are on a carbs diet and not in ketosis, and so the body isn't converting the ketones into fat, but uh, those variables are also turned to glucose, they're actually converting 82%. Okay, but we're not using it as glucose. And I think this is what confuses everyone. So mm -hmm. let's go back to the mitochondria. And we talk, you talk to every single one of the, those persons about the citric acid cycle and, and the mitochondria getting the, the protein. We, we know that the mitochondria doesn't get glucose and it doesn't get ketones. It gets a C C a coenzyme, right? So mitochondria has no idea what it's getting. So the question is, what is going to get stuck at the pyruvate step, which is a step, um, a couple of steps removed before the food actually hits the mitochondria in acetyl uh, coenzyme form and uh, removed from being a glucose or um, a protein. And of course, fat, when we eat fat, it, it does not go through the pyruvate process. And even in protein, some proteins under some condition can bypass the pyruvate process. So when they bypass the pyruvate process and they enter the citric cycle somewhere else, then they're absolutely nothing to do with glucose, right? Because pyruvate is the one that converts the glucose into something else. The ones that uh, bypass the cycle, they may stay purely as glucose and head in as that, or they may be something completely different depending upon what part of the cycle they send into. But let's look at the ones that get stuck at the pyruvate process and convert. So at the, in the pyruvate process, two things are converted. Either glucose converts into pyruvate and lactate. Uh, uh, um, lactate is what it, is, it can also be converted to, or the protein can be convert, is converted into pyruvate and lactate. And so what is lactate? So lactate is when 
Um, the mitochondria says, my stomach is full, can't take more energy in, so hold the fuel. The pyruvate process cannot hold it. It has to pass it on to something else. So at that point, it will convert it to lactate. And so the lactate then will head back to the liver. So this is where we get into the liver. Um, and in the liver, the lactate has, can take one or three routes. It can either return back into the pyruvate process right away, depending upon, I don't know what, because I'm not, that's not my uh, area of, of expertise, or it can convert into glycogen, which will then be used as gluconeogenesis, and in fact, will become glucose uh, for the body as, as we need it, or it can turn to triglycerides, which is a storage form, which is considered to be more permanent. And this, that, whichever it becomes will depend upon the amount of insulin available at the time. Interesting. Okay, so the higher insulin you have, the more likely it will be converted to triglycerides and stored because insulin is anabolic, right. right? So it's going to uh, convert it into that. It's not going to be converting it into glucose uh, via, the, uh, via glycogen because insulin and glycogen processes are uh, negatively impacted. So you have to blow insulin to produce glycogen, right? And then the, uh, the lactate, lactate can be used directly by certain organs like the brain. Uh, some of the parts of the brain can use lactate, which is a modified glucose, um, but not every organ like the red blood cells can't use lactate. So it's going to go back up either to be converted to by weight or go back up to be again, uh, processes, triglycerides or glycogen. So not much of the protein, if you're looking at it this way, will actually convert to glucose. Because if you're, even though it can't convert to glucose, that, what that means is that it's going to convert to pyruvate. And so at that point, you need to decide, or the, the body will decide, well, what is going to be the role of this pyruvate? And so it's different from when you eat glucose, say uh, you eat an apple and you bite into it and the glucose hits your blood right away, bypassing everything, and it just becomes glucose. That's not going to happen in the case of protein. Something has to take that protein and convert it into glucose. It's yeah. not going to happen without it. And so when we're looking at that, for example, in the case of, say, you're on a carbohydrate metabolic process or glucose uh, that metab metabolic process and not in ketosis, then 80%, 82% of the protein will turn into glucose. It's not turning into glucose, it's turning into pyruvate. And then from pyruvate, it turns into whatever it needs to turn into based on what the body needs. And so this is why those people who use a continuous glucose monitor and are on a carnivore diet see a very flat line blood glucose. Because if it didn't happen this way, if, if 64 to 82% of the glucose, uh, 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 the amino acids that could convert to glucose, convert to straight to glucose, you would see a huge spike. But you don't see that. Oh, that's of course. I stopped, wearing, I stopped wearing mine because it was never moving. <laughs> it was just exactly. And so we can talk about that too, whether that's good or bad, and that's a completely different story. But it's not moving, and it's a sign for you that it may be turning into pyruvate, and it may be turning into triglycerides if you eat too much, which then your body will later use because you're in ketosis, right? And so in the ketogenic diet, what is your body using for fuel? It's using triglycerides converted into ketones. So basically it's a full circle, right? You're not actually converting and using it as glucose, even though those were glucogenic amino acids, but it converted to triglycerides, which then your body can use in a different way. So That's it, really uh, interesting because I did see one, one piece of research saying that actually carnivore diets were deepening ketosis. And I was like that, I don't know how that would be possible, but that yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it can. It depends on how you eat. And, and I have some uh, good um, reference material on that because in the group uh, for so many years, we've been using carnivore uh, ketogenic diet. And I have a variety of carnivore diets uh, depending upon the state of metabolic state of the person who's using it. And so uh, we go different percents of protein to fat and uh, whether they can drink uh, or have dairy or not. So we kind of sort of change things around. And so we start from the low carb high fat to a very strict 
very high protein carnivore, which is higher than what is medically recommended. So we don't recommend it for a very long term, but it seems to bring people out of insulin resistance and diabetes in a safe way without sugar crashes. So at that point, uh, I use 70% protein by weight, which is very difficult to attain. It's only very lean meats and usually no cooking with butter or anything because that's too much fat. So, and it's usually not for a long time, it's for a few months when I see that, okay, because otherwise, if you don't do that, they get sugar crashes left and right because much of that will convert to ketones. They're not ready for ketones. The body can't use the ketones when you're at such a high uh, insulin resistance. And I find this is specific to migraineurs perhaps, but yeah. it's just extremely different from other people. And I focus on migraineurs. So, my expertise will be different in this regard. But yes, so, so, so back to the point in terms of the gluconeogenesis, um, I disagree with it turning to glucose. Gluconeogenesis does happen. It always happens. It's a continuous process, whether you're um, carbs diet or uh, carnivore diet or whatever. It's a never ending process. We always use ketones because leucine, which is the rate limiting process for protein synthesis, and we all have muscle has to be in, in, uh, done in a ketogenic uh, environment. It has no alternative. So everybody on this planet at some time is in ketosis. There's just no other way. And so we are trying to sort of separate ketosis from not ketosis, but really, again, it's a continuous continuum. It's not a cut and I am in ketosis now. And no, I'm not in ketosis now. So there's just a very big differences. And I don't think that uh there is a reason to be that concerned about protein converting to glucose because you're not eating it it's not the kind of food that can convert to glucose it converts to pyruvate and once it's converted to pyruvate it's no longer glucose so it was it was never glucose to start with and it's not glucose anymore all right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. To hit the like button on your way out. I really appreciate the love. And if you are interested in trying out keto with me, having me as your coach and guide, head over to ketogenicgirl.com. Check out all the programs that I have there. I have all meal plans, programs, and also VIP one-on-one -on -one coaching where we take a look individually at your goals and diet and do food tracking and all of that. So uh, that's all at ketogenicgirl.com. And until the next episode, wishing you a fat-fueled rest of your day. And thanks for watching.